I'm gonna take a minute for the last minute crowd because we're adding people by the. Yeah, by I'm sure. Time. Sounds good. Okay, um, hello everyone. Thanks for coming virtually. Um, I'm Christopher Bracken from the Department of English and Film Studies, and I'm here to introduce our Tuesday symposium on freedom and indigenous constitutionalism, featuring our distinguished visitor for this week, John Boros, whom I hope many of you met yesterday at this time. If you didn't, John's remarkable introduction to himself is available on YouTube. I believe you can use the link on the Department of EFS webpage at the University of Alberta. Um, it's easy to navigate there or just enter a few plausible keywords into your favorite search engine. And um, I think you'll find it. So our speakers today will be John Boros, who is the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of Victoria. I'm not going to reintroduce John after yesterday's introduction, but if you missed it again, I'll encourage you to look it up. Our other speakers are Darcy Lindbergh. You want to wave Darcy? There he is in the squares. Um, Darcy Lindbergh is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Alberta, and correct me if I'm wrong, a former student of John's. Um, his research focuses on constitutional and legal theory of the Plains Cree peoples in relation to land, water, and animals, and the trans-systemic relationships with Canadian constitutional law. Our second speaker, well, we're probably not gonna go in order, but second is Joshua Nichols an assistant professor also in the Faculty of Law, and I believe also a former student of John's, who, if I'm not mistaken, has two PhDs. Um, you might be saying, where does he find time? A PhD in philosophy and in law, philosophy from the University of Toronto, a JD from the University of British Columbia, and a PhD in law from the University of Victoria. Um, his research centers on the deeply complicated and conflictual constitutional relationship between Canada and Indigenous peoples, in particular, the notion of Crown sovereignty and how it has become entangled with um, the Westphalian model of the state, that is the state as politically self-contained and legally autonomous unit for singular people or nation an entanglement which effectively sets the boundary of constitutional interpretation in Canadian courts and confines Indigenous peoples to the status of, quote, cultural minorities with a limited range of charter analogous rights. Um, our other participant is Christine Stewart from the Department of English and Fit Film Studies. I have to thank Christine because she literally joined at the last possible moment, like less than 24 hours ago. I think I got an email, it, something in the morning, two or three this morning. So thanks, Christine, for coming out and participating. Christine is really a poet. She is an associate professor in the Department of EFS, but poetry and writing poetry are her thing. Um, she's interested in the role of poetic language and form play in the production of knowledge, which I think could be a valuable addition to this conversation. And the practice of concretely addressing issues of social justice in language. Um, she's interested in the ways in which language can be formally and contextually engaged to reconsider and potentially re-articulate the world. In recent years, she's worked with Ruben Quinn on a class called The Poetics of Treaty. And I'm hoping we might hear something about that in the course of this discussion. So three lawyers and a poet. Um, the focus, I think, will be um, the relationship between law and literature 
in the sense of narrative. So John, I think you're gonna start with the presentation and then we'll have a kind of free ranging conversation between the panelists. Miigwech. Yeah, so three lawyers and a poet walk into a Zoom screen and <laughs> it's uh, so good to be with you. And I'm really appreciative of the invitation again to uh, be here. Thank you, Christine, for responding and look forward to um, learning with you. It's so nice to be able to make this acquaintance. And thank you, Josh and Darcy, for being a part of this and everyone who's gathered together today. I hope that uh, there is a participatory element that uh, we can all engage. And uh, I expect that uh, yesterday being any guide uh, that there'll be good uh, questions and opportunities again for uh, learning. I want to start by discussing the theme of the book. There's a couple, Nib and Aki, Earth and Water, and they've taken a long time to get to know one another. And uh, Nib is always going all over the place and never quite certain where and when and how um, Nibi will end up in any place. And a kit is just always there, always settled, stable. Uh, you just know where you stand on earth or with a kit. And so earth and water, Nibi and kit, um, they, they have a, a complicated relationship, but it's a relationship that is attractive and they are attracted to one another. And uh, through a long period of getting to know one another, exploring the different possibilities in their relationship, they uh, become a couple. And eventually uh, they um, conceive and they have a little one. And uh, this little one is a bit of both of these personalities, but of course is his own personality. And they go through the naming ceremony. And through that ex a naming ceremony, they, they bestow a name. And then they watch to see what other names might come as time goes along. Uh, they try to encourage this little one in all the different ways that they can, um, watching for those gifts when they emerge to be able to encourage them and to find ways that they could flourish and this little, little boy could flourish. Um, as it uh, kind of goes through toddlerhood and into uh, sort of five, six, it's quite apparent that this young one is very athletic. And so the parents, particularly the father, Nibbe, devotes a lot of time to encouraging these hand-eye coordination skills and skills of strength and speed. And uh, they do, of course, balls and sticks and competitions and wrestling and um, practice in relationship to targets. And the skills of this uh, little one just heighten uh, because of all this attention and the sort of almost natural sense that uh, this young one has for that athleticism. Uh, you know, five, six, seven goes along and just keeps getting better. And they start to uh, enter this one into the competitions that will happen when people gather together during the maple sugar season. Um, you know, people have been separated as families around the territory through the long winter, but you gather together as the water starts to flow uphill, right, as it flows up the trunk of these trees. And so there's lots of time for the little ones associating with one another and some competitions as a part of that. So uh, this one is a part of these competitions and he almost invariably, if it's wrestling, uh, will get the upper hand and pin the other child. If it's uh, uh, sort of target oriented, will be best at uh, catching the closest to the center. Um, if it's throwing, uh, goes the furthest. And if it's racing, we'll cross that finish line before the others. And this brings him a lot of satisfaction, this little one. Of course, it makes the parents quite proud and it's a really nice time for the family and the community. Father redoubles the efforts there and uh, there's a lot of 
lessons and camaraderie that develop as he becomes eight, nine years old. As these competitions happen, and sometimes they're in the summer, it could be uh, when people are gathered in the powwow season and the ceremonial season where there's also time for uh, not working so hard and some of that uh, leisure that's a part of Anishinaabe life. Um, but they notice uh, every once in a while as this young boy is running, he'll just hold back a little bit as uh, they cross the finish line and he'll let another child uh, win, go in front of him. Or if uh, they're wrestling, uh, he might uh, just move uh, sideways in a way and another child will be able to pin him. And uh, sometimes he's not quite as enthusiastic as he might be with the targets and the distance with throwing. And eventually the father says to him, what are you doing? I know you can, you can win. You've always got this great talent and look how hard we've trained. Are you, are you wasting this? What's, what's going on? And there's got a little bit of a tension there, but the young man loves his father, loves the uh, events that he's involved in. He says, I really love seeing others win. Nothing brings me greater happiness than to see someone else go across the finish line before me or someone else succeed uh, as we're wrestling together. And that just brings me joy. The father's a little taken back by the mother's um, understanding of that. And yet they want to press. You can do better. But this continues. And eventually the Nibit and Akit talk with one another and say, you know, maybe that's not his gift. Maybe he's not to be the best in the land in relationship to athleticism. Let's see what else is there. And they think about what he's told them and they, they remember how beautiful he sings and they think about his attention to uh, intricacies and the mysteries that surround us. And they, they eventually identify there's something very spiritual about this uh, young boy. And, uh, and so they devote their time after talking with elders and others to helping raise him up in that way. And so he's taught about all the plants, the medicines that surround them and how the medicines, mashkikih, the strength of the earth, uh, give rise to different lessons that uh, can be applied not only for physical healing, but also for understanding how to bring uh, peace in one's heart and put uh, families together. And so they learn about the cedar tree, Gijik. And Gijik's the word for sky and the relationship between the sky and the cedar tree uh, that comes through that. Uh, and then they, they look at the little berries that are around them, uh, Minak, the, the, the little goodness that's found in those uh, seeds and how they bring forth. And they just do this with plant after plant, and this young boy loves it. And then he's taught by the elders, taught by grandmas and grandpas about all the possibilities that are found in the stories that are attached to the language that are a part of the knowledge of the earth and the water and the sky. And he just eats this up, uh, and, he, and it's, a, it's, a, it's like a one continual round for him. Of course, he continues to sing, and uh, he becomes a storyteller, becomes someone uh, as he kind of eight, nine, ten, eleven, that uh, is absorbing all of this around him. Uh, about thirteen or so comes the time when you will put out uh, young Anishinaabe boys on the land for a vision quest to Powajigewin, and so everyone's excited because. It's expected with all this preparation, you know, now through four or so years with the, the community and the earth and family that uh, something significant is going to happen. So off he's placed on the land by himself for that four day period, left alone to apply and observe and receive uh, something that uh, uh, is in um, that context. Four days comes and goes, and the father and mother come back to the site, and they can see this young man is crestfallen. Nothing has happened. You never share what you dream, but you share if something has happened, and this didn't happen. And you know, they try to console the young man, and they try to point out that these things occur, and this will be strengthening for you, and it'll develop resilience. And so he's encouraged. 
but the parents are a little bit disappointed. And uh, the father said, well, we probably need to work harder. And so this next year, the father sort of redoubles the effort and the young son is happy to receive that attention. And the mother is like, this just seems like it's a little too much. And there's some friction that develops between Nibe and a kid. Uh, but uh, Nive can't really see it because he, he just feels the importance of this task of this young man succeeding. And so with that redoubling, lots is learned, another year comes and goes and the young man's put out on the site once again. Um, four days comes and goes and at the end of that period, it's the same result as last time. And this time there's a little bit more explicit, uh, like, what are you doing wrong, young man? Uh, maybe you're not thinking of this or forgetting that. And so there's, you know, that more tension grows. And the father says, I think we should redouble our efforts again. And the mother says, this is not good. This is not the way we should be proceeding. But this man goes along his way. And this young man continues to learn. But there's kind of an undertone that sets in in the relationship. And uh, he says, you know, I wish we could spend more time on the songs. I love the plants. I love the stories. I really appreciate this time, but I, I, I just love that part of what we do. And so they, they devote time to that, but they give so much time and attention to other things. And, and this tension starts to grow between the, the two, as well as between Nibe and Akia. Another year comes and goes, and it's the same result. Three times now, he's gone on a vision quest, uh, fasting, uh, without food and drink, uh, opening himself, taking all this in, and, and nothing uh, comes about. And so Father says, let's do this again. But over that next year, it's uh, not anything like it was. And it's, a very, it's kind of a solemn and a solemn uh, experience for the young man. And it's also becoming that for the older man too. And yet there's an obvious love between them there's an obvious wanting to encourage and uh, strengthen and be with the other. And uh, it's, uh, it, it has that sense of poignancy to it. Another year comes and goes and this young man is put out on the vision quest uh, uh, site and the four days come and go and the father comes to that site. And this time there's no young man and the father as well, that could be. Maybe he's seen something and followed it to understand, uh, you know, what is his dream is about, what his vision is about. So he says, I'll just sit down and wait here. And as he waits, he watches the sun rise and nothing. Sun starts to crawl across the sky. Time extends. Sun starts to set. Beauty of the birds, the beauty of the stars starts to uh, come out, but there's no young man. And the old man is frightened. Maybe something has come along, a bear, a, a cougar, uh, maybe he's fallen off a cliff. Uh, um, and so there's this anxiety, worry that develops in the father. Um, he's there all night and the sun rises next morning. He's been waiting now for 24 hours and nothing. So he goes back to Nibe and reports what's happened. I can't seem to find her son. He didn't return. He wasn't there when I went. What, what should we do? And so they launch a search party and people go in the four directions to try to figure out uh, what's, what's gone on. And as they, they rise in the morning, again, the sun is beautiful. The birds are singing. The wind is in the trees. It seems like everything should be right because of that joy they feel, and yet there's no young one. So they explore, they explore for days, month, nothing. And eventually they've resigned themselves to something has happened or this young man has just voluntarily chosen to go away. And this, this, this man, Nebe, is just crestfallen. And of course that creates uh, uh, sadness. Keeps returning to the site. And as he does so back and forth, he notices the beauty of the place. He always seems to be accompanied by so much of goodness, but he can't help but feel drawn down as he's there. 
And these uh, months turn to years, turn to decades as he visits this site, reflecting on, thinking about what's occurred there. Eventually 40 years passes and it's a beautiful morning like so many of those mornings, the birds are just so strong in his ears and he feels the beauty of the warmth of the sun and the wind. And as he's there, he notices this bright light that sort of suddenly sort of suffuses the scene and it sort of comes down and settles on him. And there before him is this uh, son. By now the old man, you know, father has been bowed down in years and yet he's so excited, his eyes brighten up and they, they embrace one another. And um, it's just this reunion as if they hadn't passed. Finally though, the question comes, where have you been? What happened that day? You're out on that quest. And this uh, young man says, I saw you that day as you came to the site. I saw you that day as you watched the sun crawl through the sky. I saw you that day, our community went to look for me and I kept trying to tell you, I am here, I am here, I am here, I am here. And you couldn't hear me, you couldn't see me. And I've been here all through these years as you've come back to this site and it's only now that you're hearing me. Let me tell you what happened that day. As I was dreaming, as I was in that vision site, I suddenly felt suffused with light. I could see this brightness just extend out beyond me. It was a, a quality of the color of the sun. And at the edge was this blackness and I was caught up with this brightness and I was taken up into the sky and I became Opiche, which is Robin. And we, your family, have been singing to you all through these years from the trees, Opichiwak, uh, trying to let you know we found our gifts, we found that strength, and trying to bring that joy to you. So that is freedom and Anishinaabe constitutionalism, how we are constituting, how we are constituted. The word in Anishinaabe for freedom is Debane Jagazawin, that's actually the word for citizen. One who owns their relationships, their responsibilities uh, for their relationships. It's related to the word for freedom, Debane Indizawin, which is uh, the ability to be free, to own your relationship. So the word for citizenship, the word for freedom is about owning our responsibilities in our relationship, freedom and uh, Anishinaabe constitutionalism. And I wrote a book, of course, about this, the subject of today's seminar. And uh, here's just a little bit of a um, point. The book is about questioning first principles through six different chapters, law and mobility, civil disobedience, distrusting Canadian constitutionalism, living trees and originalism, legislation, and then violence against uh, Indigenous uh, women. These... Uh, Principles of freedom are written in our stories. Here's Nana Bojo on petroglyphs, our trickster that I talked about yesterday, who's simultaneously charming and cunning, harmful and helpful, kind and mean tricks, living a life of freedom. Talked a little bit about my great grandfather yesterday, 50 years a chief, last hereditary leader, first elected leader, who could go from Cape Croker to Ottawa, to Toronto, to Detroit, by running throughout the territory uh, because of what his mother taught him, that medicine woman, Margaret McLeod, free, free to be able to travel around the territory without uh, taking much with him because everything was surrounding him. This is uh, the elder that I've learned most with. He taught me Anishinaabe Mwen, published 25 books, 18 in Ojibwe, sorry, 18 in English, the rest in Ojibwe. Um, I was at a powwow once um, and I was being teased because I move a lot and people were saying, you can't hold a job. <laughs> and it was, it was good natured ribbing, but there was a lot of truth in it. Um, and after this went on for some time, he said something to me like, 
That's okay, John. Our people were born to be free, free to come and go as we please. That's who we are as Anishinaabe people. And I was grateful for that because he kind of took some of the focus away from the teasing, but he also taught a great lesson uh, about the ability to live with the Bain Jagazawin, to Bain Nindizuin, um, to not just be stuck in one frame, one place, one way of thinking through uh, something. Here's the Anishinaabe people. Talk about freedom. Look at that kind of mobility as uh, we surround uh, the lakes uh, and uh, have been uh, in many parts of the, the continent. And so these chapters then just develop these themes that were physically mobile as well as philosophically mobile as Indigenous peoples. Um, but it's not just about staying put and being mobile. It can also be about uh, digging in with uh, the, the disobedience here. That is, obedience to our laws might be disobedience in accordance with Canadian law. It depends on whose legal frame you bring to those questions. Uh, understanding that our constitution is full of suspicion for Indigenous peoples uh, because of its colonial nature, uh, but also understanding there's possibilities in this as well as we look at different philosophies, living tree constitutionalism, originalism. Thinking that sometimes legislation can be helpful. And then of course, looking at this question of uh, um, gendering constitutionalism and making sure that we see that it's not just serving men and that it uh, questions male dominance and uh, questions the, uh, and through section 35 itself recognizes that uh, these rights are guaranteed equally to uh, what, says, what it says male and female persons. Um, so that's in a nutshell. My hope is to resist essentialization, resist fundamentalism, resist a priori explanations that try to absorb everything into one narrative or one framework, right? Nuance is sacred. Beware the danger of a single story. Uh, the point here is to recognize there's possibilities in many uh, pathways. Yes, we can make generalizations. Yes, we can be tentatively uh, putting forward uh, propositions that might guide in many, many settings, but not all settings. And uh, that uh, constitutionalism is kind of a call to self-reflection within Native studies, within law, uh, within political science, within our disciplines um, about the seductions of single sourced uh, explanations that can get us uh, some way, but also eventually run up against uh, their limits. And um, so for me, freedom is bobbing and weaving between the different frames that might be there. And some people might say, well, you're all inconsistent then, or you're complicit in one frame or another frame by thinking you can do this all across the way. And probably, probably I'm complicit, probably I'm contradictory. Uh, it's likely that there's pieces that don't fit together. And I love having those drawn out to me so that I can uh, try to further refine because um, there are better and worse. Um, but I also worry about the perfect being the enemy of the possible or the good. And so this, this approach uh, dealing with uh, constitutionalism, conjugating law again, uh, thinking about it as a verb, not just as a noun, is a way to think about uh, how we coordinate our affairs, regulator, regulatory, a dispute resolution, but of course much broader than that. And so I took half an hour, but uh, I think I might lay out some food for thought as we now have a conversation with one another. Okay, thank you, John, for that great introduction to discussion. Let me just ask the other panelists now if anyone has something a little extended they want to say, or should we go straight to conversation? Okay, sounds like conversation to me. Um, who wants to start?
that's a dangerous aspect is that it, a conversation might be extensive as well here. So, um, yeah, so I guess I'll start. I, I try to make a joke here. So I guess I've volunteered myself. Um, just wonderful for this uh, invitation. Thank you, John, for in, inviting me to be a part of this and another guest. And, and uh, thank you, Christine, for joining us in such short time. And um, I, there's a quote, I don't know who said it, but in the heart of every lawyer is a wreck of a poet. I'm sure that is not my words. I heard it somewhere. And so um, we have a commonality here. I've been trying to think of a good punchline to your joke there, John, and I couldn't do it. Throughout the time, your stories were so encapsulated. I couldn't do it. And, and so I, I, you know, I, I had some things prepared and then like always John talks and says the exact same story you're going to say. And no, I'm just kidding. Um, just takes you in another direction here. And, and when I think about this talk about this book, um, so I was a law student and, and I went to school just really engaged with what I thought would be helping out my, my community, um, and our communities in Alberta here. Um, and went there with an idea of what law was. And then not only with John's book, the one he's talking about now, but his other books, really just like this talk reorients what you think you're doing or going to say in, in another direction. And I think that is one of the, the really obviously beautiful things about John's work um, is, is taking that that idea of constant, so this one about constitutionalism and talking about it on a Shinabe perspective, how we think about that in our own legal traditions here. And so as you're talking, John, I was just thinking about, we talked that we had a talk, um, I think it was last week um, in a different thing and where John asked me to talk about our pipe ceremonies that we have here in Hialaski and how we think about that as an important part of our legal traditions. And I talk about it as a way that we have ceremonies that constitute us even for a moment uh, when we hold those. And, and, um, and I was also thinking, so as you're talking about this, is th that idea that I like to start to think about is how we're drawing in other agents, as you talked about here, John, into our, our relationships. And I often talk about the pipe ceremony as, you know, a constitutive practice, our, our communities. So I know even just in our Musquachese communities, they talk about this as like the pipe being our constitution. And in uh, this idea that when you're talking about being hypocritical or challenged or firm in your thoughts, I think about those elements of the pipe and, and, and how that forms us. And I think about, so we have, we know for our pipe ceremonies that the two elements that form together are the wooden structure of the pipe stem and then we have the pipe bowl that's this this uh this stone and we have stories it depends on our like my family has particular stories in in our pipes how we hold them and other families will have theirs and there's community that might share some stories and one of them I was thinking about is the idea of the malleability of of that stone right and and so then it was drawing me to this story we have about um the buffalo stone or buffalo child or we call it mistassini as well big stone in saskatchewan and that story talks about this child who's in between these two worlds um, of uh, mustas so our buffalo people and and the nehiel the the cree people the nehiawak and just as torn in between like living as part of a, a group that constitutes themselves that needs to nourish on the other and but also knowing that's where they came from so they were a child who was born Cree were lost on the prairies this this uh this 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 cookum this grandmother lost them and is raised up by buffalo peoples and then eventually is told that they're Cree and they actually go back and they relearn this so that that relation to your story, John, about being a part uh, away from a community and going back and having that outside lens. And so that outside lens, what it teaches us is that this, this person is able to see in these two worlds and actually goes back to the Mustus, the, the Buffalo people, and talks about like how angry it is to, to see the way humans are, to see the way they create. And, and so it's a, um, an older Buffalo that tells him that, you know, like, yeah, they, they do hunt us, but also we have a, we have law, we have a legal relationship together. And part of it is what we, we often talk about as, um, as uh, guarding against pastahoin or transgression, um, that they don't hunt us too much, um, that they leave us gifts. So we know that gifting is an important part of this as well, 
in our relationship and that they ensure that we succeed through our generations and we give them everything. So we give them their food and their clothing. Um, and part of that is we're able to regenerate from the land. So when you say Aki, we talk about it as Eski, the same sort of thing as well. And and so that's one of the stories I like to talk about that actually talks about law that actually that's within the dialogue. It's like the the child and the buffalo are talking about law. But when we turn to our stories, we can start to see how we have all these sort of constitutive relationships there. Um, so what this has to do with concreteness and in John's kind of lesson that he continues to teach about not entrenching yourself and thinking about a legal tradition as like so poorly formed that it can't move is in that story, um, you see that sort of fluidity between that boy and the two nations, the Nehiawak and, and the Mustus, um, and that choice. And then finally, that elder buffalo gives him a choice and says, you can actually, I'll, I'll show you a ceremony where you roll over four times and you can just be, you can just be a stone if you want. Um, and so the child chooses to do that um, because he can't take living in this like world with disparate, despairing means and, and having to negotiate and, and chooses to be a stone and so does this and becomes the stone. Um, so, so when we think about our stones, we think about, so again, I'm going to, again, thinking about John's work. When I was a law student, I showed up thinking I was going to learn constitutional law from, uh, I have a constitutional law book here holding up my screen. I'm not going to pull it out, it'll fall. That's what I was going to learn. And then the first class, John walked in with a rock, right? And he talked about the Anishinaabe constitutional principles with that rock and, and, um, and, so just think about that, that, that even just that scene that's in my head about that is that I thought I was going into something that was so fixed and it was something so malleable. Um, but John was showing it by showing something that was really fixed as well. And then when I learn our stories, you learn that rocks are, are so malleable. So, um, so it's just such a fruitful engagement when we think about the stuff that John is working through in these books. And, um, I guess I'll finish my short, I told you it was going to be extensive um, comment here, is that um, I've, you said I, I'm a former student of John and I was going to joke that barely a former student because I just finished my PhD, but the reality is we continue to, um, to learn from John as he continues his journey through his work as we look at um, comparator legal orders in, in that work, so I'm grateful to be a part of this. Thanks, thanks, Darcy. I just want to make two comments. I know we're going to continue to talk with others here, but uh, just for those that are joining later in the week when we read the Roundhouse, there's a version of this Buffalo story that Darcy's told in the middle of that Roundhouse book that relates to the Roundhouse itself. And so just twig into that as you uh, read. And I also just want to share this screen for a second and uh, remind us of this uh, Buffalo Treaty that has been... Uh, uh, developing between the um, um, Buffalo and the Indigenous peoples of this area, that is signing a treaty with the Buffalo <laughs> and in relationship to the Buffalo. And the idea here is to have the Buffalo again return to their former range and run from Yellowstone to the Yukon. And you can see all the different First Nations here where there's a little Buffalo piece uh, image, sorry, that are um, a part of that uh, treaty so far. And that treaty has a song, and that treaty has a story, and that treaty has a gathering associated with it. There's a document that's a part of it. And uh, if you learn from Leroy Little Bear about it, uh, that's where I've uh, understood it. And Buffalo, of course, were introduced into the back country of Banff for the first time about two years ago, for the first time in about a hundred years. And uh, the idea is that those uh, um, relations, those folks, <laughs> will eventually uh, run uh, more broadly because of that constitutive element. So thank you, Darcy, for the, that comment. It's just so evocative of what's happened and what's happening uh, with our, our relations. Uh, thank you both. Um, Christine, you said you had something that might take a few minutes to say. Would you like to speak next? Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I, uh, 
I'm not sure what's happening here. The host is following. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm going to ignore that then. So, yeah, I came in at very much the last minute, um, but it is an honor to be here. And um, so I'm, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak to you all and to meet John Burroughs, somebody whose work's been really, really important to me for many years. Um, so I'm currently on unceded territory of Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam and Squamish nations. So I wanted to mention that. And I also wanted to acknowledge the land of Treaty 6 and Métis Nation Region 4 that I miss very much. <laughs> and all of you there, and those of you who are elsewhere too that I recognize, it's nice to see a lot of all those faces. Um, so I'm a uh, Northern Irish English background and my field is uh, experimental or innovative poetics. And the last few years, um, maybe, I you know, five or six years, I've been thinking a lot about what might constitute a treaty poetics. And so it's just really interesting to, um, to listen to these stories and, and to think about that in the context of the work that I've been doing. Um, I'm not a student of law, as you know, I've never been a student of John's, but um, I, uh, I noticed that lately um, that when people ask me what I'm reading, um, I'm reading Nayawi Wen. And I'm not, I'm, 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 I know very, very little. I'm, I'm in no way could I say that I speak it, but I'm really, really interested in it. And I've been working with um, Nehawi when instructor Ruben Quinn for the last four years, and we've been running this treaty poetics class. And the reason that we have made this um, kind of remarkable effort is because it kind of occurred to both of us in a conversation about five years ago now that um, Nehawi Win holds um, the treaty laws in its in its words, and and so um, when we encountered uh, John's essay um, last, really last year, Earthbound. Indigenous resurgence and environmental reconciliation. Um, it was really, it was very exciting. And I think for, I don't want to speak for Ruben, but he was he was very excited at the time to um, to encounter a similar kind of way of thinking about laws and the ways in which they're embedded in uh, Anishinaabe Molin. Excuse my my pronunciation. Um, so we we have been working on this, um, this idea of, of, of how one might kind of encounter the laws in Nehawi Win and the, the ways in which treaty relationships are kind of embodied and embedded in the, in the language. And one of the ways that um, Ruben teaches is through the spirit markers and, uh, or syllabics. And, and th this is kind of an important aspect of the teaching because then you learn the original sounds of the language and you don't have the um, the kind of baffle of the SRO, which kind of overlays an English, um, possibly overlays an English pronunciation. And we think very much along the, the lines of Jeanette Armstrong um, with the idea that, that, that the language, the indigenous language from the place where it comes, it, it actually speaks the land. So it is, it is the land embodied in a particular way. And that's another reason why the spirit markers are so important. So you can sound them out um, and have the land hear you in the, in the way that uh, maybe, maybe it needs to. Um, so we work, they learn the spirit markers and, and then um, we also look at treaty. And again, uh, John's, John, your work is really important in, um, like locating the history of treaty in Canada and the Royal Pro Proclamation and the Niagara Treaty and 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 also really important for the students is that understanding that um, the Indigenous nations were active agents and you you mentioned that yesterday and I that's something that we've been talking about for years and I, I just that the impact that has on the students particularly the young Indigenous students who are often coming with a very different understanding of their legal history is is profound. So that's, that's always something really, um, I always find really re remarkable. 
Um, so, so I was talking, I was talking to Ruben last night after, and, and uh, just about coming in today and, and what that, what that might look like. And, um, he was very interested. He unfortunately could not be here, but he was very interested in, in me coming and interested in me talking about the way the students learn the connection of Neha we went to the land, the connection of all humans to the land and the ways in which we need to honor those lands, those laws and those relations. And that learning Neha we went through the spirit markers bring us into this kind of direct and profound relationship with the earth, which is very much something I think that uh, John that you, you speak to. Um, and the idea of um, the ways in which uh, the idea of mio wakotu and um, good relations is, is embedded in the language. And Ruben also wanted me to stress that <clears throat> thinking about mio wakotu and that, um, that land was included in treaty. Um, as he said, no, there was no war or strife allowed in certain areas. And there were certain areas where no one was allowed to live. And yet the nations always communicated with each other. They were not always at odds with each other. So this is me, I'm citing Ruben here. And also important, he wanted me to mention that it's, it was against the law for, to kill female animals in the spring unless people were starving. So his, his point was that there were treaties with the animals, human to duck treaties, human to deer treaties, and, and I think this echoes the teachings of others that I've um, worked with, like uh, Elder Bob Cardinal and, and reading Sylvia McAdams, were, who both teach that the original treaties were also between humans and the elements, humans and, and the more than humans, and humans and the water, the wind, and the grass, and the earth. And, and that, again, the ways in which that's embedded in, in the language. Um, so, I guess what what I was really important to me in, um, in in your work, John, is, and this is something that comes out of that essay too, which just will stay with me forever. Indigenous law can be seen literally written on the earth, and the idea that indigenous laws are a way of organizing life, that to me tends to life, <laughs> and those 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 relationships. Um, and learning the ways in which laws are storied in the language and by parsing the language as a form of reading its stories um, and learning how to live well, as you say, by giving our attention to the earth and taking direction from her. Um, and if you can just spare me a couple more minutes, the last thing that, that Ruben wanted me to say um, is to share his spring teaching, which is very much like, um, again, what you do with um, reading your own language through and the law through the laws of your people and vice versa. So Ruben, Ruben says this, spring is a time when the earth expresses her love. And it's very spring here. I don't know quite what it's like in Edmonton, but I think we're John and I, it's really happening now. <laughs> so energy comes out of the earth, the buds unfurl, the earth comes into view. This coming into view is a form of earth love. Sagi pakao. This means the trees are budding. It is a time of leaf budding. Sagi pakao we be sim. Leaf budding moon, or as we say in English, May. This is related to sagi hitoin. Sagi hitoin. Love. This in turn is connected to sagi, sagi bakao, all the plants coming into view. This in turn is related to sagewe, coming into view. Sagewe, that is, in, for example, she will show herself. The bear shows itself in the spring. The earth's children are coming into view. Aski Otawa Sinisa De Sage Wewak. The Earth's children are coming into view. And so for Ruben, this teaching demonstrates, and as and John's work demonstrates, 
that by attending to indigenous language, we can take guidance from the earth. And we turn our attention to the legal traditions that are of the earth, bound to the earth and storied in the earth. And that maybe that's how we might live well. So thank you. Miigwech, that is very beautiful. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you for your colleague too. That's just so fantastic. Um, I, I think about treaties that exact same way. And uh, our, our laws are flying and they're flowing. And they're, as Darcy explained, they're there in the rocks. Um, those spring teachings are, are teachings that uh, enlighten us. Um, Zagi Baga, the, the leaves coming out. Uh, Zagate, the sun shining. Uh, Zagin, the river flowing. Uh, Zagi, love, right? They all have this, um, they all teach us about how to live um, with love, live supporting one another with that energy. Uh, your, your teachings remind me, the teachings you shared, remind me of um, the flowers I saw this morning. Uh, Wabigwen is one way of saying flower. A wab is the word for light or white. A gun is the instrument of. So all of these little beings that are coming up, Wabigan, the instruments of light. There's also another word for them, Wasconie. Uh, konie means to dress, was is light. So they're dressed in light. Um, the, the fact of that energy being transferred from the sky to the earth dresses those beings in light, which gives us sight, hope. And then of course, as we partake, as we, not just with our like eating, but just partake, uh, we also find that uh, light, that, uh, that brightness, and we become dressed in light as well. And so the, the treaty of hope and obligation is to support one another so that we can enjoy um, those good relationships as we learn from the, the law professors that are the plants and the animals and the rivers and the waters. Um, and that is the treaties um, that were there before Europeans came along that we had with the natural world and that we tried to introduce to others and are still trying to introduce to others say this is a part of what it means to be a treaty person. It's not just the number of treaties, but what's behind those treaties, which is the treaties that we have with the waters and the skies and the plants and the animals and the earth. So thank you, Christine, for that. And boy, what a great course to be involved with pulling on the language in that way as well. Thank you. Hey, um, Josh, maybe. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, like Darcy, I'm a, I'm a former and, uh, well, current student of John's in many ways. Um, and the aspect of John's work that um, remains uh, key to my own and, and what I keep learning from John um, is how we engage in the practices of legal interpretation uh, within the common law tradition, perhaps. Per, um, with particular focus in it for me. Uh, in John's book, um, the relationship between living tree uh, forms of interpretation and originalism and the kind of commitments that these uh, models of legal interpretation draw us into. And the, the particular focus for me um, that I think John makes so salient is how a, a colonial constitution continues to exist within Canada's current constitutional order. Um, and that colonial constitution can be found in the 19th century in explicit forms, right? The legal fictions that were used to um, force indigenous peoples into a, a non-reciprocal relationship with uh, the artificial legal fiction of the crown um, were ideas, um, a family of, of legal fictions um, from the European tradition uh, known as, uh, on various labels, Doctrine of Discovery, Terra Nullius, uh, and the Civilization Thesis. Uh, they all operate to reduce the legal personality of indigenous peoples um, to subject peoples, to, to like wards, um, uh, so that they don't have legal rights to respond. They're given obligations, but cannot respond back to obligations. Um, and so they can be governed uh, without any responsibility. Uh, and, and that was the 
structure of the Indian Act um, that gets laid out in the more explicit bills that really form its core, the, the Gradual Civilization Act and the Gradual Enfranchisement Act. Um, and while in Canadian legal interpretation, we reject those fictions formally, we begin that process in the 1970s with Calder, we continue it with uh, cases like Simon um, and Guerin in the 80s and move it forward into to Sparrow. The, while we've rejected the, the explicit language, um, I think John shows how we can draw out that implicit um, within our current language, that colonial constitution continues to, to come forward and that there is a practice of um, using legal interpretation to bring what is implicit um, into explicit um, daylight so that we can all collectively address it and decide what we want to do with it. Um, and I think when John talks about, you know, uh, showing that law is not just a noun, it, it, it's a verb. I, I think it, it shows that, you know, language is a constructive social project. We're not talking about an, uh, an a priori assumption um, about the nature of sovereignty that is a definition that we have to refer to and is static across time. That's not how legal systems actually work. And that by making our implicit commitments um, explicit, by meaningfully in introducing the Aboriginal perspective into common law interpretation, um, that we can show that legal systems are not enclosed holes. And so that when you participate in one, when you work in one, you're not being co-opted. Um, you're participating to draw what is implicit out into being explicit and then call for responsibility. Um, and, and I think that that um, is a deep lesson uh, about um, making law explicit as a verb, as a series of social practices. And then we can't, um, as John likes to say, uh, you know, the perfect is the enemy, the good. Uh, and we, we're human, we don't have access to the perfect. And those who like to articulate their arguments in some claim to perfection in order to denounce uh, reality just end up making an excuse for for not doing anything. Uh, I mean, the, the German tradition has a concept called the beautiful soul that, that sort of attacks that uh, notion. And I think John's work is, is excellent in practically engaging in the process of calling Canadian law into responsibility. Um, so that's something I'm uh, continually grateful for. Thank you, Josh. I mean, it is my goal not just to revitalize Indigenous law and see its resurgence, but I also have my eye on the common law and want to see a revitalization there and uh, an understanding that that itself can be participatory, although it's um, sort of encrusted by so many institutional uh, and, and cultural formalities that sometimes make it appear as though law is just something that's done to us. In fact, law can be seen as a verb in uh, that that other uh, set of traditions as well. And so I really appreciate you bringing that forward. Um, that is, there's some insight that's brought uh, as you look across uh, in a trans-systemic way, how um, traditions can encounter one another and uh, you know, putting different angles of vision together through the trickster or through perspicuous contrast or trans-systemic engagement um, is, is one of the ways that you start to question what your assumptions are because you can see other possibilities and other alternatives as they're framed in uh, different, uh, different systems. And I appreciate you bringing out the idea of originalism and living tree as well, because I have to admit in interpretive terms, sometimes it seems to me what we're doing by and large in the law is looking for the original meaning. You know, what is justice or what was said at the time that constitutions were passed. And of course, we want to think about what is justice and we want to know what happens at the time these things are passed, but we're not just in the past, right? We are ongoing people that continue to learn and, uh, and uh, have a fluidity and a dynamism. And so I, I, I'm attracted to the living nature of interpretation, even as I want to be honoring of the, the roots or the, the initial insights that might be there. I I want to also see that we just don't get stuck there. Uh, roots without uh, um, trunks and branches and leaves are not very productive. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to uh, think about uh, that. And I, you know, I think about different interpretations, different interpretive traditions around the world, say in relationship to the Quran or in relationship to the Bible or in relationship to some of the canon of uh, law or literature. And we're, we're trying to get into the minds of the people at the time. And again, that can be a very productive and good thing. 
Um, but it seems as though to me, the Quran, the Bible, the, the cases, the, the canons of whatever the, um, cultural traditions we come from um, can um, be more um, interactive than just uh, once upon a time, here's what happened at the moment of drafting the constitution or ratifying of the constitution. Uh, there is, um, there's, a, there's a community that's involved in relationship with one another in relationship to the texts written and unwritten and flying and walking and flowing and blowing across our face, right? Though there's so much written in that uh, uh, setting, that legal archive of the earth as Christine uh, was talking about. So thanks, Josh. I uh, really appreciate your feedback on that point. And I'm um, grateful again for Darcy, Christina, and Josh for their countries. I think we'll keep having a conversation here. There may be some questions that Christopher or others uh, can direct us to, or we can just invite people to uh, join by expressing their ideas direct directly. Well, in fact, we have a question on chat. So just to remind people, you can raise your e-hand, which should be available on Zoom, either as a reaction or under chat, the chat function, or you could actually raise your actual hand, <laughs> wave, <laughs> wave at the camera or otherwise light up your square here on non-Hollywood squares. Um, but we have a question from Sarah, I think. My access to chat is very awkward on this computer, so apologize if I goof this. Sarah has a question on chat right now. Um, if we look at a constitution as a collective set of values, how does, for instance, Anishinaabe law deal with changing collective values? Sarah's so thinking comparatively of the recent backlash against the British royals, the astonishing revelation that the British royal family might be racist. And the way the colonial constitution is, we still, right, they are the crown, right? They have the crown. Um, and the way that the colonial constitution is not easily modified to change the head of state if this was desired. So, open question. Thank you for that question. How do Anishinaabe people take account of changing values? I think they definitely do. And uh, that might seem contrary to the way people think about Indigenous peoples. Our Canadian court says, what's Indigenous? I kid you not, this is the definition. What's indigenous for an Aboriginal right is what was integral to the distinctive culture of those peoples prior to the arrival of Europeans. If you can't claim that what you're doing now was integrity to culture prior to the arrival of Europeans, that's not an Aboriginal right, right? Which of course is freezing Aboriginal peoples in a certain time of European arrival. And, and some uh, folks, that's what they view indigeneity as being about, is what, what was at that time integral or what was once upon a time who we are as people. And as we go through time, we sort of resile from or become diluted from some magic moment of authenticity or perfection or super Indian or <laughs> indigeneity or whatever the case might be, the label you throw upon that. And that's just problematic because it's always integral to any distinctive culture to react to the newness that comes around them. So Anishinaabe people, were changed by our relationships with the Haudenosaunee as uh, we entered into that, uh, I, I think I showed you last time, this uh, wampum belt of uh, you know, peace and friendship and respect that we would share out of one bowl and uh, we would bring something that wasn't threatening, a spoon to that dish so that uh, we would uh, live in peace, right? So the Anishinaabe people were changed in relating to the Haudenosaunee. And then on the Western doors with the Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, we also had conflict with them. How do we put together our memorialization for peace? They gave us a big drum. The Dakota gave the Anishinaabe a big drum. And when you go now to Minnesota, Southern Manitoba, Wisconsin at this time of year, what are Anishinaabe people doing? They're gathering in big drum ceremonies singing Dakota songs, telling the story about this relationship with the Dakota, and, uh, and having a feast and a giveaway. Um, so, so, you know, we dealt with uh, this uh, with our neighbors. Um, so we had that fluidity there. And of course, we dealt in this way 
with uh, the crown also. And so what's going on here? It's a process of intersocietal engagement. It's a process of reciprocal elucidation. It's a process of uh, saying the world has a lot to teach us and our way is not the only way. It might be that we will reject some of the things that come amongst us because they don't correspond with our preferences, our hopes, so what we, re what we regard as free or good. Uh, but there are good things that uh, might be uh, there amongst other things that aren't so uh, positive. And it's, it's uh, finding uh, that engagement. So that's one answer. Another answer is Anishinaabe people counsel together. How do we take account of change through time? Um, we, we try to persuade one another. And you see this counseling process in our creation story with the, with the I don't have time to tell it, but with the, on the back of the turtle and the animals uh, talking with one another. And eventually the little muskrat is the one that uh, comes up with an idea and comes up with the earth <laughs> that uh, we build uh, ourselves. Um, that is a Anishinaabe central teaching and uh, I've heard that from Soto people as well, but it's not about a turtle, it's about a little a mole and related to gifts that uh, the buffalo and the pike and the eagle aren't able to bring forward in the same way that the mole might bring it forward. So we, we deal with change through time by talking with one another and persuading one another in the context of our traditions, but recognizing the traditions aren't fixed with their walls or their channels, that there's opportunity for for learning and, uh, and fluidity in that space. Anyone want to jump in on that question? Darcy might have views about how things change through time. I know that he's uh, written a thesis about uh, ceremony uh, in his master's and then of course in his PhD about land-based uh, learning. Yeah, I mean, I can offer some quick, I can offer some quick comments. I was hoping John would address Meghan Markle there, but he kind of sidestepped that part of the question. I know that's where we're getting at. Um, we're 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 past the heaping praise on you, John, and into the teasing part of the lecture here. So, um, yeah, no, I I've thought about this question quite a bit as well, um, especially because I've I've thought about our ceremonies, so um, Cree ceremonies, and how. Those are not only a source of legal pedagogy, but also um, a source of law as well. So I talked about the pipe ceremonies. And so then I think about how do we change these? How do they evolve? We have um, we have procedures and protocols in our ceremonies that are gendered. And, and when we think about gender orientation and um, expression, what does that mean for our ceremonies and their evolution? And so part of it, I'm going to give like the slow answer because I did write a master's on this and I could Go, for, go, for, go a long time here, is one, we just have these interpretive changing traditions within our, what I talk about, for lack of a better word, is institutions within Cree law. Like our stories, not only are they adaptable for us to use them in different ways, um, some have protocols as well, but some we can use to teach and we can adapt characters. Um, there's, there's a lot of complexity to that, but also we've seen our stories actually talk about transformations as well. And so even that story I talked about, um, uh, a boy who, um, lives with Buffalo and is transformed into us and into a rock, it talks about transformation and it teaches us that we can do that. We also know the history of our, our ceremonies have changed as well. Like we know, um, there's been talking about our, our sweat lodge ceremonies and, and, um, there's some traditions where these were um, based upon like well, some beliefs that males partook in them. And then eventually, even in those kind of historical traditions, the way people talk about them, the inclusion of, of women in them. And then so, so that's just to say that these dialogues are ongoing. And what I'm, I don't want to sound like a social scientist here, like what I'm fascinated about, what I'm always really interested about with this is like, um, what is the, um, not the proper method for change, but what is the way that we have this collective strength in these methods for change? So one, it can be this outside, like for example, when we think about ceremonies and if there is a thing that is, there's unequal gender roles, those things like that criticism from that like equality level, which 
can occur, but then also like what are the processes within our ceremonies that allow that dialogue, argument, um, fighting, um, change to occur, norms to change. I think like when you think about a legitimacy of like a constitution and a legal system, that seems like the way that I always think about that ground way up. And so, um, so yes, we're always changing. And, and it's like, how are we changing is like the really important question for me. And, and how do we ensure, even the way we talk about these things, like even talking about ceremonies, how are we able to talk about them as changing is a really important um, kind of dialogue that I, I like to, to think about and um, upset people and get yelled at and make a fool of myself and talking about it as well. But it's just all part of it, right? just posted in the chat function a beautiful presentation by my colleague, Brenda Child, my friend who teaches in the history department at the University of Minnesota. And she talks about the jingle dress coming out of a pandemic. And uh, uh, because a young girl was uh, suffering, there was a dream and father in relation to the dream uh, made this beautiful dress and she was healed. And then the, the process of that ceremony of that uh, jingle dress coming the powwow circuit into people's lives in a very strong way that some people might think jingle dress has always been with us but in fact uh, it's a very very powerful illustration as an answer to the question that uh, was posed around change and, and if you want to be in, uplifted and inspired watch Brenda Child's video there from the University of Minnesota it's uh, just beautiful and it so relates to the present moment right because we're in a pandemic and look what we, our ancestors did to bring forth healing after the pandemic with the jingle dress. I'm so excited for the possibilities over the next uh, couple of years as we bring forward this ongoing nature of our traditions to speak to what we're going through and what we're coming through uh, as, as we, uh, we, we hopefully exit this pandemic. Other questions from other panelists or from the... So I see a question here in the chat and it looks it's like it's uh, from Liz and I'll just read it. It says, Professor Boros, you remind us that laws are written, unwritten, flying, walking, blowing across your face in stories ceremonies in the spiritual world. In treaty poetics, how do you communicate, how do we communicate those laws in a colonial court? What communicative tools are working in your experience? Um, I remember my colleague who taught at the University of British Columbia, um, he was one of the first professors teaching law in this field. Um, his name is Michael Jackson, not the singer, but a, a really significant uh, academic. And, and when um, the Haida people were trying to get recognition in relationship to Lyle Island, um, what he did is he advised them in the background, but as he suggested that they actually stand forward at the bar with the, the consent of the judge and in their button blankets, their robes uh, with their authority and, uh, and speak and sing directly uh, to the issue of um, that uh, land and the Haida continuous occupation and the objection to the Crown's uh, uh, use of that land for forestry and other purposes. And that has an impact uh, when you can sing in court, when you can come in uh, with these uh, other symbols of law. Of course, we have a contrary example uh, in the Delgamut case with Chief Justice McEachern, who heard this singing uh, by Gitsan with Soatan elders as people were robed in their clan house uh, uh, regalia. And he objected to it. The Crown insisted that he hear it. And then he said, I have a tin ear and I've been judicially embarrassed uh, by having this occur in my courtroom. And so sometimes, the in, in light of my theme here, right? Uh, sometimes it can be successful to bring out uh, those ways of communicating directly in our own uh, traditions. And at other times, we can find ourselves thwarted by it, which is, again, why this book is trying to make the point that don't just stick with one theme. If that doesn't work, go with something else. And sometimes it's a lawyer making a well-crafted argument 
that uh, finds a loophole or further develops, uh, analogizes a case that might not have been as fully in their attention in the past. Uh, and that can be effective as a communicative tool. And you know, there's this idea of, of uh, Indigenous lawyers being like briefcase warriors, right? And uh, they're there uh, doing another type of uh, battle. And I say again, don't put all your eggs in that basket either, right? Because that can be failing and can also uh, just lead you down a path where you're captured by the court and its structures and that form of argumentation. And so then at other times um, you have to sit on a blockade. And that's the best way to communicate about uh, what our uh, views are, our laws are, and uh, you know, that could be filtered into court. Sometimes that's helpful, sometimes that's harmful. In other words, let's sing and dance and be poetic and be logical and use science and find um, what the listener might be best persuaded by in the particular context that we find ourselves. And I shouldn't talk about the details of um, contract law when I'm uh, um, you know, on a trap line. That's, that's not the place for it, but there is a place for it, um, but it's not every place. And I think that's the hope of this book is to try to generate that message or, or just echo that message that others are saying as well. Because I do worry when um, there is a kind of fundamentalism that creeps in, an essentialization that can creep in amongst some of our advocacy efforts as if there's a way to do this um, that uh, will save us. Would other panelists like to chime in on that question? I'll take that as a no. Um, then perhaps another question from the virtual floor. Josh might talk about language games at some point and uh, some of that philosophical tradition because it does, what I'm saying can be framed in other ways as well. You gonna pick that up, Josh? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, uh, Wittgensteinian notions of language games, uh, being that they're committed to focusing on languages as practices um, and not abstract semantic systems, um, play a fundamental role in, in how we think through law and avoid the kind of originalist sticking points that try to anchor law in a particular moment in time and say that it can't move past that point. Um, and I think they provide a lot of strategic resources, um, but like any philosophical tradition, um, and I think John John's work highlights this, it, it's just one sort of tradition in, in, that you can draw from. I mean, another one you can draw from would be American pragmatism. I mean, Bob Brandom's work uh, it highlights um, how to do very similar things with words. Uh, you could use uh, Quentin Skinner. Um, there's a lot of different traditions, and I think that, um, you know, John's work has, has strong connections with the work of James Tully, who he's worked with for a long time um, at UVic, and I was co-supervised uh, by Jim, um, and so I sort of mix and match and, uh, and use these traditions to, to try um, best to, to bring um, implicit uh, commitments that are there um, into explicit form. So that no one can argue that they're not committed to that. That once they've said those words, then you've made those commitments. And, and I think that there's various art forms you can use to, to draw that out. But I think that, um, you know, that is, in my uh, view, the, like the role of justice and, and uh, the kind of work of it. So I don't know if that speaks to it, but that's how I like to use language games. I can't help noting that whenever Wittgenstein talks about language games, he always introduces or invents a tribe. 
And that is actually the word that's used in the English translation of many of his works. Imagine a tribe in which, and then he invents this game. So it's fascinating that the Western philosophical tradition can't conceive of these possibilities without racializing them, according to, I don't know, the dictates of pulp fiction or Hollywood films or whatever, or last generation's anthropology. Um, is there another question from the floor? Or is there one on chat that I'm not seeing? As we wait for a question, I was gonna say the invention of a tribe, that's kind of what John just said occurred in the, the test for Aboriginal rights, right? He said that integral to a cultural, you know, the, the integral to a distinctive culture that's like kind of just like creating a tribe, an imaginary, anyway. That's just my, my comment to fill in. That's a really good point, Darcy, um, because what is the court doing but drawing on a stereotype about a once upon a time that then they want to see in the present. And if you don't meet what was integral distinctive culture in their imagination at a certain time in their history, then you're not Indian or in Métier Inuit for the purpose of constitutional uh, protection today. That's a, that's a very, very good way of saying that, Darcy. And I think taking up um, how the Sprachspiel, like the language games are talked about in terms of a tribe, I think it would be confusing to conflate it with, um, like uh, anthropological notions that he was actually criti critically engaging with. Uh, the Sprachspiel is supposed to show that the language practices are local and historical as opposed to trans-historical and a priori. Um, and so the way he's using a tribe is not pejorative in any way, shape or form there. Um, and I think the, the, the like if you just take a look at culture and value as one of his texts, uh, I think that's pretty explicit. He's trying to draw us into context, right? Dale Turner, our colleague who teaches at the University of Toronto, studied Wittgenstein with um, uh, Jim Tully, and Josh has heard me talk about this before, but Dale says that he's a Wittgenstindian, <laughs> trying to put together Wittgenstein and Indians. Um, question from Samantha on chat. Is there a way to talk about legal traditions and the treaty agreement for the medicine chest and the pestilence? Yeah, that's a really fantastic uh, question. And Darcy might have something to say with this because he's uh, studied the context of the treaties that have uh, this more prominently in them. But uh, you know, when people came amongst us, uh, we offered them aid and uh, that was what Christine talked about was the idea of pointing people to the earth. And if we have a good relationship with the earth, uh, we will be sustained. Uh, we will find, uh, um, health and, and wellness. And uh, we've, when we've gone contrary to that, as many of our stories talk about us having done in the past, we've over hunted or you know, put too much demand on a particular animal or plant or, or fish, um, we suffer and they suffer. And so the, the, the understanding of the medicine chest clause in the light of uh, Cree and Anishinaabe and Dakota and Dene understandings would, would say that uh, medicine, mash kike, right? Mash is the strength, akke, the earth. It's the strength of the earth. And, uh, and, and makak is a box, a mash kiki makak. Uh, makak is uh, this um, sort of holding together. Uh, like our word for this month is sometimes Umakakinsigizes, Umakakinsigizes, that's the frog moon, Umakaki, Umak is a box, a key is the earth, that is the, those that are boxed up in the earth, the frogs, right? So you think about the language as Christine was talking about, you think about where it points you, uh, where does our strength come with boxes, like that little frog just being there, waiting for that next season to come up again, right? There's that medicine chest when you need you arise, mashkiki, there's that strength that's there related to the earth, that's our medicine. Suddenly that clause takes on such a different meaning than um, you know, what did the crown think they were saying? We're trying to sort of untangle the crown's meaning there. This court has said, uh, you know, trees are to be understood uh, transsystemically, a large liberal and generous perspective 
uh, giving um, 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 deference or, or, or our understanding to the natural uh, nature of this from the Indian's perspective. And so if we thought about treaties in that light, um, we would see the medicine sh chest claws, uh, we would see frogs, <laughs> and we would see little plants uh, growing up uh, to bring us life and health. Yeah, and so I would add on to it, like, you know, in, in, in Nehelu, and we have similar words, right? Um, like, like, whiskey is our medicine. And, and so it goes to kind of what Christine shared about Ruben's words about what lands we used. I know our oral histories, let's say we stopped the thinking about giving up whatever we, uh, the land for agriculture at the mountains because we have like the mesquite, the medicine hills that are right there as well. And, and that medicine was there, but it's also, I think about the medicine chest clause as like the long, like kind of like an affirmation of our oral histories as well, because we know that there actually was um, a smallpox epidemic. It was right before the, um, the negotiations of treaty six, like when I say right before the six or seven years before, but also there was a smallpox uh, outbreak decades before as well, where there actually was medicine provided um, to uh, Cree people. And so that memory of that provision from um, from the British was still within our communities, right? And then, so that's why it was asked so, so explicitly in Treaty 6, and you don't necessarily see it, just that history and that context. So there's one way of thinking of that, and it, that's pretty practical. But when we think about how, like, for example, the Musquachis communities invoked the medicine chest clause last year, probably right around this state. Yeah. And, um, and it's that idea that beyond like what was negotiated and written down on the paper is that risk, that relationship of renewal. And like, we're this treaty relationship. That is something that is the pipe that was brought there was meant like we were, um, you know, it's often talked about as being a cousin-like relationship that we're going to have this renewal. Um, and whatever we've agreed here, we're going to continue to renew that relationship. And I, I, that's kind of the spirit I hear. Um, and so you might hear the same from, from our old ones about like the renewal of that. And, and so um, we can get locked into thinking about very specifically, like the clause says, at the Indian agent's house, which there isn't um, anymore. There's gonna be a medicine chest. Is that gonna be like behind their cabinet? You know, that sort of thing. Um, but what is the spirit of this? Is that like in a time of pestilence and famine and pandemic, we can go to this government um, as a nation to nation relationship and be secure. And so that's where we see that negotiation. What, com what gets close so complex is not that look at, for example, Plains Cree law and treaty making there, but like the other colonial layers of it. So the Indian Act, et cetera, right? That has really changed how the interpretation of that clause is. Excellent. Um, that actually brings us to five o'clock. So if nobody has a burning comment that they just have to share with the group, um, I think we can wrap there. I just want to remind you that um, if you want to join John's office hours at one on Wednesday or one on Friday, the office hours will last 15 minutes or 15 minutes. I don't know. It'll be up to John. Um, I just shared my email. So send me um, an email and let me know that you want to join office hours and I'll send you a link. I've already received a few emails, so I'll be sending out links. Um, I'd just like to thank our panelists again. That was a great symposium, and I learned a lot. So I don't know, maybe we could do this. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take Thank you, Thank Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be back tomorrow at this time for a lecture. Awesome.